Well, good evening, everybody. And before we begin our proceedings tonight, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting tonight, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And it's upon their ancestral lands that the University of Sydney now stands. So tonight, as we share our knowledge, our research, our learning, um, I'd like that we should pay respects to the knowledge embedded for it forever within Aboriginal custodianship of country. My name's Carolyn Mackay. I'm one of the co-directors of the Sydney Institute of Criminology here at Sydney Law School. So thank you very much for coming along tonight. Uh, just to give you a bit of an outline of what we'll be doing, we'll be having um, our panel discussion um, and then we will have some time for some uh, Q&A with you as well towards the end of the session, of the end of the panel discussion. So do think about any questions you might like to ask. Um, the event is being recorded, so uh, the cameras are primarily aiming at us, but just be aware if you do ask a question that your voice will be heard on the recording, uh, but there should not actually be any capturing of your, uh, your face or anything like that. So just be aware though that we will have a recording recording of the event. Um, so I just wanted to give a little bit of uh, background to the event tonight. Tonight we're looking at criminalising children and should we be raising the age of criminal responsibility? A really uh, in interesting uh, recent prompt for this is the fact that the Northern Territory has become the first Australian jurisdiction to raise a minimum age of criminal responsibility from 10 to 12 years old. Uh, Victoria also proposes to raise the um, age to 12 by the end of 2024 and possibly then to 14 by 2027. The ACT is also looking at raising the age to 12 quite soon and then possibly to 14 by 2025. On top of that, we can also look at the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child that says that 14 is the minimum age that any child should be charged with a criminal offence. However, in New South Wales, the minimum age remains 10, which is one of the lowest minimum ages of criminal responsibility in the world. So while a child under the age of 10 cannot be convicted of a criminal offence in New South Wales, a child, and we, we also have this notion of a child between the age of 10 and 14 is presumed to be dolly incapax, that is, incapable of um, bearing criminal responsibility. Nevertheless, that, that presumption can be rebutted by the prosecution on evidence for children uh, between that age of 10 and 14. But the question really is, is the age of 10 too young to criminalise any child? And what harms accrue to incarcerated children? I don't particularly look at this um, particular topic in my own research, but I'm doing other research at the moment affiliated uh, with this, uh, with criminal justice. And uh, recently I was up in the Northern Territory and speaking to a youth justice worker who was talking to me about very young children being criminalised in the Northern Territory from the age of 10. Now, that is, uh, as I've mentioned before, is changing. But she talked about some of the harms that accrue to these very young children. And she talks about the trauma that's inflicted on them. And she talked about the trauma of actually being held in Dondale Detention Centre, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. And she described it as a horrible, horrible, horrible place, a very unsafe place. Um, so I just sort of wanted to mention that by way of background. I also just want to mention that tonight's event has been somewhat prompted by a special issue of our journal. We, the Sydney Institute of Criminology has a journal called Current Issues in Criminal Justice, and we have a forthcoming special issue um, that is focusing on the ra raising the age of criminal responsibility. It's going to be published in the new year. Uh, the editors, uh, the guest editors rather for that, are Jacqueline Allen and Jason Payne, both from Griffin, uh, sorry, Griffith, Criminology Institute. And that's going to be um, uh, very much looking at various issues to do with raising the age of criminal responsibility. So do look out for that if you're interested in reading some uh, more about that. And indeed, I believe that one of our panelists, Crystal Lockwood, is um, contributing to that special issue. Anyway, 
It now gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, the panel tonight. So first of all, we have our chairperson, who is Professor Megan Williams. Uh, Megan is a Wiradjuri through parental, uh, sorry, paternal family and has worked for over two decades advocating for the use of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's expertise in health service design and evaluation, research, ethics and university curriculum. Megan is a principal of Ulang Indigenous Evaluation and she's also worked for many years, I believe about um, three decades uh, in the tertiary sector, most recently at UTS. So uh, Megan will be our chairperson tonight. I'd now like to introduce our panelists as well. So perhaps starting from right next to me, we have Professor Thomas Crofts, who holds a joint appointment in the School of Law and Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at City University of Hong Kong. He was formerly a professor of criminal law here at the University of uh, Sydney Law School and was also a former director of the Sydney Institute of Criminology. His research has a particular focus on the criminalisation and criminal responsibility of children as well as comparative criminal law and criminal law reform interests. Um, Next to Thomas, we have Dr. Crystal Lockwood, who is a lecturer from Griffith Criminology Institute based at Gr Griffith University. Crystal is uh, Gumbangye and Dung Dungati and grew up in Armadale, New South Wales. She is an applied justice researcher with method methodological expertise in qualitative, realist and indigenous research and evaluation, as well as experience in quantitative methods. And as I mentioned, she's also uh, an author in this forthcoming special issue of criminal justice, of current issues in criminal justice. Finally, we have Mr. Rob Hoyles. Robert Hoyles is the Director of Criminal Law for Legal Aid New South Wales. He's an accredited specialist in criminal law and holds an Executive Master of Public Administration. He's previously had many other roles with Legal Aid New South Wales, including previously being a Deputy Director, um, Project Lead of the Early Appropriate Guilty Plea Implementation Team, and a Solicitor in Charge of the Sydney Indictable Team. Please join me in welcoming our Chairperson and our panellists tonight. How's that sound? Good. Thanks so much, Carolyn, and yeah, thank you to the panelists for joining us. Um, we're going to just introduce ourselves a little bit more and discuss for about five minutes each um, some of our um, what we bring to the table today. And starting with myself, thank you, and um, and then we'll have some time uh, for some questions to be posed within our table and then from um, yourselves as well. Yeah, so thanks again, Carolyn, for um, inviting us here today. And, and I think firstly, uh, a sensitivity warning. You know, it is very important though that we uh, collectively are here and that we have courage in the unity that we have here um, to air these issues. And it's not everyone who is willing to show up for a couple of hours, you know, on a, on a work night, on a school night, out in public um, to face these and air these. So, yeah, very much appreciated. And after this, hope that people can continue to keep in touch um, so that we can support each other in our ongoing work and have questions answered as well. Because as you know, the, the picture's horrendous and it's worsening. Um, and I wanted to... Um, start by saying what I bring is public health and um, public interest journalism into criminal justice and is especially Indigenous public health. Um, we're known for our holistic thinking that has a lot of integrity, for our connections to the past and also for our intergenerational transfer of knowledge as stock standard in, in everything that we do, centering country, centering our cultures, and progressing into the future based on really solid understanding and trust for ourselves and care for ourselves. There's so much that Indigenous peoples bring, yet 
all too often the deficit discourse is overwhelming and it's played out in the media. And it's uh, one of the most horrendous times at the moment causing a lot of division um, between you know, a lot of members of our families and communities and organisations as well um, with the referendum in only a f uh, four weeks time or so. Uh, so yeah, just to keep that in mind too um, and anyone that seeks follow up do feel free to approach uh, myself or Caroline directly as well and, um, and we'll make plans. So I also wanted to acknowledge Sophie Trevitt uh, some of you will know, and she was the executive officer of the um, Change the Record Coalition and was one of the first people to really spearhead the Raise the Age hashtag and the campaign. And also some of you might have seen those amazing photographs that were shown of um, people when they were 10, you know, now being adults, but people when they were 10. And so Sophie really nailed that message in, in, in image. And she passed away in July, so I'd like us to dedicate our time in, in memory of her and carrying her messages forward. Um, and she said, uh, even as her aggressive cancer progressed, she was still so um, on point and her biggest fear for children in jail. Um, at some point, society decided that it was not only okay, but beneficial to lock up children as young as 10 behind bars. She said, I've spent a long time trying to imagine that moment. Imagine closing and opening your eyes and thinking, okay, this is it. This is the way we will restore harmony to our streets. We will put children in cages and adults behind bars. So obviously there's adults, there's humans in our community making those types of decisions. And it's, it's um, our you know, dream that we find ways to um, address that um, deficit discourse and the, the damaging approaches. But even the justice reform initiative saying at the legal aid conference yesterday, they, they can't get through in Queensland, the situation's worsening with um, the media and the Premier there. Um, so bringing public health to, to criminal justice um, and bringing Aboriginal culture to criminal justice and the strengths of Aboriginal culture, but it reminds us that it's, um, it's absolutely not Aboriginal culture um, to lock people up. And since you know, time immemorial, our societies did not do that. They actually did not necessarily even separate people who had caused harm to others, but brought them closer. And in Aboriginal ways, Wiradjuri ways, young people are sacred, children are sacred because they are our caretakers of the future, not only of us and our bodies, but of our lands and our um, knowledges. And so about that label youth offender, you know, I reject that and bringing public health thinking to this, we see upstream, midstream and downstream determinants of um, individuals' actions and systems. And we know that there are solutions and there are good um, economic solutions that one silver bullet is the multi-level thinking, the socio-ecological thinking or the holistic thinking meaning we need action at individual, family, community, services and system levels simultaneously and evidence at each of those levels for what works and evaluation as well as transferring that knowledge for the next generations to continue um, the work. Uh, one way that I'm contributing and um, continuing work from um, over 15 years worth of relationships in, in Queensland, um, the pilot of the Indigenous mental health intervention project, horrendous name, um, unfortunate. And um, in, in Brisbane with adults, um, piloted in 2014 based on um, a range of Aboriginal led research. And that model became business as usual to the point that um, the Department of um, Community Justice and Corrections and Health um, asked for similar work for young people in Brisbane youth detention and Cleveland youth detention. So a group of us got a Medical Research Futures Fund grant. Um, and we've, I wanna read out some quotes of um, some in-depth interviewing that's been done with young people in detention there. I just also wanted to reflect that um, those young people as young as 10, um, some of the younger ones, the data shows that they're more isolated and in, locked up longer than some of the older ones. So 
they say, um, what was going on for you before you came here? And here's a few quotes. I was in child safety. Child safety kicked me out. I was using a lot of subby and Xanax and chroming. I was doing crime with my mates. I was stealing cars. I was living on the streets. Some really bad things happened to me. So voices of different young people. And they say about alcohol and drugs, yep, um, a lot of yandi and ice, but helping deal with trauma and problems and um, drinking on certain occasions, but yandi helps keep me calm. Some other things they said about help or support that they would like, they want to live, I want to live with my family. I want help to learn to do everyday things. I want to get a trade. I want a good place to live. I want to talk about my problems with someone I trust. I want to play footy. I want to keep learning to read and write and do maths. I want to live with my mum. So just to bring those children and young people into this room and Indigenous young people well overrepresented and obviously locked up so they can't be here to speak for themselves um, at this event tonight. So I might pass over to you, Robert, shall we? Hard act to follow, can I just say. That was very moving, thanks for that. Um, I want to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I want to say that National Legal Aid has spoken out in support of raising the age of criminal responsibility to 14, um, of which I'm very proud. But ultimately what I say tonight is going to be my voice, not the voice of Legal Aid, and I just want to make that clear to everyone here. What I bring is, I guess, the experience and perspective of a criminal lawyer. And I'd like to acknowledge um, some of my colleagues in the audience today, um, all of whom do the very, very challenging job of representing vulnerable people in custody every day. I have represented young people as young as 11 who committed serious criminal offences. Um, our Children's Legal Service at Legal Aid is a legal organisation committed to representing some of the most vulnerable people in our community. And what we know about those young people, some as young as 11, is that they are unlikely to understand the impact of their actions or have the required maturity necessary to properly attach criminal responsibility. We know from the research that they have immature brain development, they don't have the necessary cognitive function, and they're often impacted by complex and cumulative trauma. We know that kids in the criminal justice system, particularly those very young kids, have higher rates of childhood neglect and trauma, have higher rates of abuse, are susceptible to the effects of fetal alcohol syndrome and its impacts, have drug and alcohol exposure, are often from out of home care, and are involved in the child protection system, what we know in the business as crossover kids who bounce in and out of both systems or they have a disability. We know that there's a significant overrepresentation of First Nations people. But most significantly in some ways, we know that the early contact of people with the criminal justice system, in most cases, ensures an entryway to what can be a lifetime of crime. In fact, the research suggests 85% of kids aged 10 to 14 who enter supervision return to supervision between the ages of 15 and 17, 85%. So what we do know right now is, unfortunately, what we have in place is not a very effective way of changing the behaviour of young children. And I agree with a lot of what you said in terms of the response. We need a whole-scale system response. Um, we know that locking up kids is, is incredibly expensive. And so for every kid you don't lock up, there is real scope to reinvest the money in other places. It costs about $3,500 a day in the Northern Territory. It costs somewhere between $500,000 to $700,000 a year for every child we lock up. What we need to think about is what the alternative could be. And that whole scale system response needs to be educational. It needs to be medical. It needs to be psychological. It needs to be social. And it needs to be cultural. I'm just going to leave you with this thought. One of my colleagues up in Coffs Harbour, 
and I were doing the children's court listing in Coffs Harbour one day. And she was trying to get this 13-year-old bail and released from custody. And he said, not today, miss. It's chicken burger night tonight in custody. And what a travesty that the, the situation for that 13-year-old was he would much prefer to stay in custody with his mates then return to the traumatic upbringing that awaited him on the outside. But what it does mean is that the current, where we are right now is that so many of our clients are desensitised to custody. If it is the case that you're putting someone in at the age of 12 or 13 and they learn that custody is not actually a big, bad, scary place, which it can be when you're 18 and you go in for the first time, but someone without the brain development and cognitive function, who doesn't recognise that, you end up in a situation where you lose the battle in terms of making custody in any way a deterrent or in any way a way of making it a response to encourage people to modify their behaviour. Um, that's all I have to say for now and I look forward to the discussion. Great, thank you. Yeah, lots of levels for us to um, consider, you know, individual behaviour and families and systems and the circumstances, um, you know, that Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people find ourselves in um, today with multiple losses, yet so much to offer. So can we ask you, dear Crystal, for <laughs> yeah, your words? Uh, so hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. It's amazing to be at an alive, a live event with such a good turnout. Um, I just want to extend the acknowledgement to country to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, and for today, uh, I'm going to uh, my perspective I'm going to bring to the discussion is one that's really based on looking at the raising the age of criminal responsibility as a policy issue. And from all of the things that that's already been said, you've made such good groundwork for me just to go, what they've said. So everything that's kind of been said tonight, but also what we know from research, we know that this is a, a policy area that needs to change and we have mechanisms that are set up to change them. So it's just a matter of identifying the best way to do that and how we can um, dip into evidence-informed policy and implement, implementation science to do that. Um, and so we, from the evidence that we know, that we know that there's um, developmental and neuroscience is telling us that this is, we need to change this because it's just, uh, in terms of where kids are at that stage, they're just not at um, they're just not at a developmental stage to understand the seriousness of what's going on. Um, but also we can look at the decades worth of campaigning that's been done on multiple levels, particularly from Indigenous organisations. Um, if you want to have a really good look at a, a really interactive and easy to engage website, you can look at the hashtag Raise the Age campaign that's been going on for a few years now. And it brings together over 100 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations that cut across health, legal, community and human rights organisations, as well as support from health organisations as well um, that go into to looking at raising the age of criminal responsibility. Um, but if we were to look at this from a, a policy changing perspective, we really need to look at the, the, the population that we're working with. Um, and as we've mentioned, these are the most vulnerable kids in our community. Uh, if you look at any of the social determinants of, um, of, of justice or of incarceration, we know that these kids are hitting multiple um, negative experiences across all of the, the outcomes that we know. We're looking at adverse childhood experiences, mental health, physical health, housing, education. Um, uh, access to resources, socioeconomic status, poverty, FASD, across every single one of these, these kids aren't experiencing just one, it's like multiple the, um, issues that are going on. So it's complex health needs as well as social needs that we're trying to look at and trying to address in these situations. We know that First Nation kids, again, are going to be, it's compounded, particularly when we're looking at cultural risk factors as well, like, for example, experiences of, of racism. We can also see this just in what we can see in youth detention centres, where there's, uh, it's upwards of 50% of the kids in, in these detention centres are Indigenous, but it can go up to 100% when we're looking particularly at the Northern Territory. So this has become it's become a race issue because of how it's been implemented. So taking all of this into consideration, um, we do really do have to look at this when we're talking about raise the age. It's not just about changing that one policy. It's really about, we're talking about systems change. We're trying to look at ways that we can actually change how we're dealing with these really vulnerable kids. And I have identified 
three steps because we had five minutes to go into it. So I've just picked out three that I think we should lean into quite heavily when we're looking at, at this systems change approach. And the first is that we should be leading with cultural safety. And so this is a term that's come from the health sector. Um, for Maori people, uh, there were health service providers, nurse, nurses, who were trying to identify ways that um, they could bring Maori perspectives and worldviews into, um, into delivering healthcare to be able to identify those holistic views that um, Professor Williams has been talking about tonight. And so this has not just been, it, although it's derived from health, it's been applied across many dif different types of disciplines, but it's also fallen into the policy area as well. Um, and we can see that it's a way that we can identify those cultural factors and address cultural risk factors that are usually neglected within the criminal justice system. So it's a way that we can actually address that at the policy level. Um, and we know that from a lot of these types of approaches that their best practice for anyone that's in a vulnerable position. So we know that within the cultural, cultural safety approach, is, it's leaning into holistic um, care, strength strengths approach, uh, wraparound services, individualised care. And these are all things that we know uh, are good for uh, supporting vulnerable populations. So it's not just going to be, be able to benefit the First Nations kids that are experiencing these compounding effects of the, the life experience that they have, as well as the criminal justice system, but it's going to be um, accessible to a lot of the kids that we're, that we're working with as well. Um, and the next two steps <laughs> that, I, that I ended up picking out uh, lead into what we can think about as systems thinking. So this is not just looking at things or problems on their own, but they sit within these quite dynamic and wider contexts. Um, and so when we're thinking about ways to address these, raising the age, we've got to think of it within all of the systems that have been pointed out within um, within the speeches that we've seen tonight. Um, and I'm also going to be leading into um, upstream and downstream that you mentioned, <laughs> again, a term that's been heavily applied within health. Uh, but in this case, um, I, we really need to strengthen our upstream strategies or policies. Within the criminal justice system, this usually leans into crime prevention. Um, and so we can cut across the... What, one way we can describe this is through primary intervention. So this is community-based, applicable to everyone. So access to mental health care for, for children. Uh, then we can go into secondary. So that's targeted towards high-risk kids, but also high-risk communities um, and making sure that there's access to the appropriate services that they need, but also tertiary as for people who are already um, within the system. And we know that the criminal justice system usually focuses on tertiary. We're not so good at strengthening our primary and secondary um, strategies and, and policies. So it's important that we strengthen that, particularly when we're thinking of kids that are so young. Um, so again, this leans into those terms that I've already mentioned. So having those trauma-based types of approaches, strength-based, culturally grounded and holistic approaches. And the Raise the Age website has a really good map that kind of sets out a lot of really good programs that you can go and have a look at. But we also have a lot of really good programs that are already established in Australia. So there's examples like um, Backtrackers, which is a, a regional a, a program set up in regional New South Wales to support at-risk kids. We have ones that target specific types of um, children that have offended. So at Griffith University, we have GIFTS, which is the, um, the Griffith Youth Forensic Services, which supports children who have sexually offended. Um, we have some really good on-country residential programs. So at the moment, um, we've got Marla Menu in Western Australia supporting remote kids in the Kimberley region. Um, and another example is the Bunjil um, Wara, which is a residential um, youth and alcohol drug he and healing service set up in Victoria. And there's just, they're amazing programs. They provide that wraparound service and strengths-based approach, which we can, we can lean into when we're looking at alternatives when we're in this space. Um, and finally, the, the third step I wanted to point out was that the downstream of, of criminal justice policies and strategies, and that's the criminal justice policies themselves. Um, and what we know from quite extensive research, a lot from the US, but we can, we're also picking up a few in Australia as well, is that it's not actually crime rates that are driving what uh, the number of kids that are in um, detention centres or adults in, in, in 
prisons. It's actually the criminal justice policies themselves that are driving this. Um, and we have a really good example at the moment in, in Queensland. Um, I'm a, about to criticise some of the policies, so <laughs> that uh, at the moment you can kind of follow the case study within Queensland. Um, but just from this year, we can see that they released a, a brief that kind of said rates of, of youth crime are down. Despite that, they kind of brought in a number of policies that have driven up the, the number of kids that are in prison. So they brought in a, a breach of bail for, for crimes of kid, for, for kids ended up suspending the Human Rights Act to be able to bring that in. So that's also driven up the number of kids that are in youth detention centres, including in watch houses. When a test case was given to the Queensland Supreme Court, uh, this was deemed to be maybe in breach of human rights. And so in response to that, they again, uh, Queensland government has suspended the Human Rights Act to declare um, police watch houses and, and adult uh, prisons youth detention centres. So it's, it's crazy to, to, to kind of see this all unfold, understanding um, the impact that this has on, on kids as, as young as 10 within, within Queensland. Um, but in response again, I, there are the three key key terms there. And just to say that it is possible, it's not just a hypothetical that we're working with here. Um, in We've seen justice reinvestment work within Australia and also overseas uh, over the last decade or so. Hawaii has also been doing these types of system changes that have ended up in the, the end of last year when Western Australia was putting kids into adult Deten um, adult prisons, Hawaii at the same time had no girls in, in youth detention centres because they were using these types of approaches to support um, young people. So, um, yeah, I'll leave it at that and I'll, I'll pass over to... Great. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on and the elders past and present. I'd also like to thank Carolyn and Andrew for inviting me back to uh, Sydney. It's a pleasure to be back where, uh, in bring me flashbacks of when I used to be up here um, organising events. It's an honour to be talking about a topic that I've been researching for nearly 30 years. Um, and I began writing about this topic back in the mid-90s when in the UK uh, the Divisional Court abolished the presumption of dollar income tax, which Carolyn has mentioned, which was no doubt in response to the very vivid images that were circulating on the British media about the two-year-old child, Jamie Bolger, being uh, taken away by his two 10-year-old killers. That presumption was then reinstated by the House of Lords, or was then the House of Lords, but not because they believed that the presumption had any value, but because they believed it was wrong for the court to be doing that. And they urged the government to look at this. The Labour government did, and as soon as the Labour government got into power in 97, they passed a law abolishing the presumption of value income tax, which leaves England and Wales with, with one of the lowest ages of criminal responsibility in the world of 10. So they don't have the presumption that we still have throughout Australia. What I also think is really interesting is that we're seeing, I think, a similar process, but in reverse happening in Australia. So there's very vivid images of how children were being treated in the Northern Territory in the Dondale Detention Centre, which was circulated on Four Corners, caused an outcry amongst Australians. Australians could no longer turn a blind eye and pretend they didn't know what was happening to children in detention. So there was a real call then for something to happen and for there to be a change. So I've got really mixed feelings about what we're talking about tonight. On the one hand, I'm delighted that at last, after 30 years, we're seeing some change in Australia in relation to the age of criminal responsibility. I'm also feeling incredibly jaded that it's taken this long for governments to listen to all the evidence as, as my uh, uh, co-panelists have, have spoken about. There is an overwhelming amount of evidence about why children should not be in the criminal uh, justice system and do not have the capacities that are required to be held criminal responsible. All that has indicated to me that this is not just a question of normative legal capacity, but a socio-political question about how a country wants to deal with its young people who get into trouble with the law. Um, and I suspect that part of this problem, it's something that I got asked many years ago at a conference, a similar event to this that was held at the Newcastle University in, uh, in the UK, and a, uh, a colleague said to me, 
do we argue as legal academics or, or criminological academics, do we argue for what we think is the right age of criminal responsibility and that we can justify? Or do we go with what's practically possible? And I think for a long time, we've all been going with what's practically possible. And that's why I feel a little, as I said, I feel a little bit disappointed that we're seeing states and co territories pushing for 12, and oh yeah, maybe later on 14. So I just want to say here that my position is similar to the position that the United Nations minimum uh, standard rules for the administration of juvenile justice say, and that there's a close connection between civic rights and responsibilities and criminal responsibility. If we don't think children should have civic rights and responsibilities, then we shouldn't be making them criminally responsible. And I'll end on this one. If a child can't buy a hamster on their own, then they shouldn't be in the criminal justice system. Thanks. Fantastic. Well, thank you, everyone. And um, yeah, many common threads between us. And then, as you can see, um, great differences and expertise. So we've got a little bit of scope, and we've got about 20 minutes or so. And I mean, I think one of the you know, uh, we've got all the solutions here um, and then also a compelling point that you've left us on, Thomas, and I think it'd be great to explore that a little bit more. So with these states um, potentially or poised to increase to 12, should Dolly Inca packs be retained for 12 to 14? Yeah, I actually... Um, I think it should actually be increased to, to 16 or 18. So I think that, uh, you know, there's, m we can, we've heard some of the evidence already, we can talk about that a lot more, but there is clear evidence children do not have the capacity. I mean, criminal responsibility is based on the whole idea that you aren't criminally responsible unless you can freely choose to do something you, that you know you shouldn't be doing. There's much evidence that suggests that children do not have that ability, and much of the evidence is coming from neuroscience until actually adulthood. And in fact, it might be in our 20s. Um, so I think there's, a, there's strong evidence to suggest that we should be at least providing a, a presumption that children under the age of 16 or 18, perhaps, are not capable of being criminally responsible unless there is clear evidence that they do mm. have those capacities. Mm. And does that reflect your experience in reality? I, I definitely think that if the age is 12, that Dolly Incapac should exist until at least 14 in the same way as it currently does. I think one of the things about Dolly Incapacs is consideration should be given perhaps to how it could be tweaked. One of the challenges at the moment is that in a criminal process, Dolly Incapacs is argued at a defended hearing, often at the very end of the process. So even if, even though there is this presumption and the prosecution needs to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the child knew that what they were doing was seriously wrong as opposed to merely naughty, it actually requires that kid to be detained, charged, often spend overnight in custody and go through the entire process until a defended hearing often um, or nearing a defended hearing at which stage the charges are sometimes withdrawn by the prosecution or there's a legal argument and the kid might be found to be not guilty because of Dolly Incapax. So one thing that I think would be interesting is for there to be some consideration at least to whether there is a way to assess Dolly Incapax earlier in the process rather than waiting until the very end because so much of the trauma and damage that we're talking about um, might already be occasioned in the current system even if Dolly Incapax was retained in its current, in its current way. Excellent, so just, yeah. just to follow on sure. from that, I think that there is a lot of research that also shows... The, I mean, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child are not in favour of this because they say it leads to uh, sort of... Uh, at least on fair results, and there's no, you know, there's a lot of problems with how this operates in practice. And as you've said, I think a major problem is there's research. I think there's some research by Kate Fitzgibbons and um, uh, Brian down in uh, Mel uh, in Melbourne that shows that often this is treated as a defence rather than part of the prosecution case, and so it's been reversed in practice. Uh, so a, there are a lot of issues. I agree with you. A lot of issues with the way it works in practice that can be ironed out, and I think it can provide adequate protection if it's done properly. Mm. Yeah. I, I actually think one of the um, key advantages to going to 14 in one go is that it actually alleviates the need to try to find a way to make Dolly Incapax work in the system. It actually removes a lot of the complexity mm -hmm. that, that causes some challenges with it now. Mm -hmm. 
And would the audience like a bit of insight about why 12 and not 14 in the beginning? There's a few nods there. Yeah. Would you like I to? I think initially, I think 12. So but there was a challenge to in England and Wales in the European Court uh, of Human Rights on the basis that it were, uh, I can't remember which articles it was breaching to treat children at the age of 10 as criminally responsible. The court said at that point in time, there is no international standard, so we cannot say that England and Wales are the age is too low. It was interesting because a few years later, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child came out and said in, in, a, uh, in a general comment that they thought that 12 was the minimum age that was internationally acceptable, and it should be at least 12, if not 14 or higher. Mm -hmm. Then in 2019, they revised that up to 14 and said that states should aim for a minimum of 14 and it should be higher. But what has happened is, Com particularly common law jurisdictions that used to have the age level of 10, Canada, Ireland, Scotland, have all raised the age to 12. So it seems that a lot of common law countries think that 12 is politically what's expedient at this mm -hmm. point in time. Um, so I think that might be why uh, the Australian jurisdictions are still thinking 12 with the possibility of 14 mm -hmm. in the future. So it sounds a little bit historical and yeah. socio-political as well, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Turning the corner a little bit um, and thinking about um, the tension in communities where, you know, that the, the inflames the media and um, the dominance of those voices and the fear for um, lack of safety and the fear of, of the threat of, you know, in Queensland, uh, car, car thefts and, um, yeah. Yeah, and um, what do we do about that? Yeah, would you like to have a go at being I from think, Queensland? And yeah, all? <laughs> I think it's it, it is important because they they usually the um, we've had a few marches that have been brought forward by victims of that have been from quite um, serious offences, and I think it's really important to acknowledge that the criminal justice system was never really set up to support victims, and to acknowledge that from the start is really important because we could we have to find ways to address or support victims as well. And I think that's why it's important to acknowledge that when we're talking about raise the age, it's not just about lifting it and then running away and kind of going, well, they've offended, we won't do anything now. It's uh, acknowledging that it's this, we're trying to find alternatives that are more suited to, to children that have offended. Um, and so, like I, as I mentioned in, in, my, um, in my talk, we're, try, we're not trying to just say, well, we won't do anything, is trying to say, well, we have these programs that really are effective in supporting children who have experienced quite complex, um, have complex social and, and medical needs. So, um, yeah, it, it is a difficult one, though, because mm. we are, um, yeah, we are dealing with... Yeah, that's right. Yeah, sure. Could Thanks, Thomas. Up. Yeah. I, I find this a really interesting question because no one says it's about someone who's not criminally responsible because they're mentally ill. Uh -huh. you know, we don't have this reaction to say... The community has got to be protected from people who are mentally ill. So yeah. if it's really about criminal responsibility, yeah. then that's the end of the question. Mm, mm, yeah. yeah, yeah, there's something seems more sinister going on. Yeah, did you have any thoughts? I mean, I think that there's definitely... Um, I, I think you do have to acknowledge in the criminal justice system the impact that it would have on victims and the fact that um, you have to try to build a system that addresses, I guess, all of the purposes of of criminal responsibility. But, I mean, I think to, to Thomas's point, if there is a carve-out based on not having the cognitive capacity to understand or not being able to um, develop a logical response to understanding that that's the consequence of your behaviour, then a lot of kind of the purposes of sentencing kind of fall away or are not well, well suited. I think in New South Wales there are really good examples of the way the current criminal justice system, for example, through youth justice conferencing, finds a way to try to be restorative in the sense of trying to involve the victim in the process. And there can be ways that that occurs even if we, even if it wasn't criminalised between certain ages. So ways to develop social responses that can still involve a restorative approach or trying to use the resources to improve family supports or cultural supports or improve social or health engagements with young people, which I think really is the key. Um, I also think that um, the response does need to um, reflect the severity of um, the behaviour in, in, in some way so that the 
social response, even if it is a social response, is a response to what it is the young person is doing. Yeah. Crystal, did you want to follow up a bit more about some of the solutions that you think are you know, important to invest in? Yeah, I think what we've found in research, particularly when we're, um, when we're dealing with children, is to see them holistically, so not just having them separate as their own and that they have no influences around them, but kind of sitting them within their family and their community and their wider networks, as well as the impact of, of what policies are doing, um, particularly when we're looking at regional and remote and access to um, access to actual services and whether that's available. So I think the the, the best practice models that, that have been brought in are usually wraparound services. So um, you kind of supporting children within their environment um, and trying to see them within that holistic network and, and building off their strengths um, and and being able to recognise. So I think um, trauma-informed and, and strengths-based, these can be kind of terms that are, are kind of flippantly said and people will just have a program and they're like, oh, yes, this is a strengths-based program. But it's it's really important that we we take these these terms seriously and, and apply them um, within within what we're doing and um, and again recognizing that these kids have usually been through quite a lot in their very short lives um, and being able to address that within the types of services that we can roll out mm. yeah. Thomas reflecting on you know your experience in the UK have there been standouts that you think have been working there well yeah I mean what what Two things. One thing I think is really interesting is England and Wales now have a, a, an entrenched children first policy, and we have seen in the UK, um, so in England and Wales, a big reduction in children going through the criminal justice system and in care, but a stubborn refusal to raise the age of criminal responsibility with this argument that there has to be an option for the worst type of offenders, which angers me incredibly because the point is if they aren't criminal responsible, it doesn't matter what they've done. If they aren't criminal responsible, they shouldn't be in the criminal justice system. In terms of what works, I would point to Scotland with the children's hearing system, okay. where, as you were saying, is that to the child is the focus is on what does this child need. Mm. So children who are in need of, of care and protection or children who have committed offences will go to the children's hearing system and the panel will work out what, what support do we need to give to this child, either because they've been neglected or... or, or they're in, uh, in other need or because they've committed a crime. So crime is seen as, the, as a flashpoint where they need intervention rather than needing a criminal justice response. Uh -huh. It seems like prevention's kind of not necessarily even within that. Yeah. Does that reflect a bit of the New South Wales children's court experience you're familiar with? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's really challenging to think about how to make it work mm -hmm. in this way and that I, I think... It might even be New Zealand that has a, a carve-out as well yeah, yeah. in relation to murder or sexual yeah, assault, yeah. that if a young person commits those offences, they're still subject to criminal jurisdiction. Um, and obviously, I mean, as I said before, I do think the more serious the, um, the nature of the behaviour, the more serious the response needs to be. But um, whether it's crimi a criminal response or not, I guess that's the, the ultimate debate. I know that in the Northern Territory, where they're rolling this out f to 12... They've also created a program called the On the Right Track program, which is about re-engaging family and culture and community um, at the same time. And that's going to be evaluated in 2025. And I think it's really going to be really interesting to see whether or not that has had the gains that you would hope it would have. Because in a way, I think that's the closest thing to an Australian example of where we're building that. Mm, yeah. Just makes me think probably about... Yeah, hopefully the evaluators are Aboriginal, it's Aboriginal-led. There's assessments that are designed by Aboriginal people for the almost 100% of Aboriginal, um, you know, young people in the detention and the families as well. It's absolutely not a given, even though we've got ethics um, guidelines that try to shape research, but it takes ethics committees skills as well to sniff out research that doesn't authentically meet those guidelines. So there's, you know, a lot of concerns about the evidence base um, as well. But I digress. I wanted to just pick up a little bit about exemptions. You know, would you mind if we talked a bit about this very hard topic of, you know, are there crimes that should be exempt? No. No? The simple answer is no. Okay. It's because that is not about criminal responsibility. 
you know, the, the question is, should be, can this child understand that what they've done is wrong? And could they control, what we don't actually generally ask in Australia or England, and could they control their behavior according to that understanding, which is what criminal responsibility requires, and it is the requirement in civil countries like Germany, for example. And, and to me, the question is, it doesn't matter what offense they've committed, do they have that understanding or don't they? Because if they don't, they shouldn't be in the criminal justice system. And I understand that with more serious offenses, um, the, the, the sort of public reaction is more severe, but, but we, have to go, we have to cut back to what is the core issue. And the core issue is, does that child have the, understand, the ability to understand that, what they, that they shouldn't have done what they did? And, and if, if they didn't, uh -huh. then that's the end of the question. For me, that's the end of the matter. Yeah. And can you tell us anything a little bit about how that's assessed? Practice. Yeah, so uh, it's interesting because South Africa, when they recently, uh, or quite a few years ago now, reformed the age of criminal responsibility, they have a requirement um, that the child, so, so for this, we're talking really about the presumption of dollar income tax now, so if a child's over the, over the minimum age, they have a requirement that the child gets assessed by um, a psychiatrist, a psychologist or a psychiatrist to determine whether the child had the capacity. So some jurisdictions do have a, a requirement. South Africa's having a bit of a problem because they're saying we don't have the facilities in place to, to do all these assessments that are necessary, so it can prolong proceedings. But there are other things that you can look at. You can get evidence from schools or from, uh, you know, from people who know the child well. There's, there's lots of things that can be looked at to determine whether a child does have that mm. um, ability. Mm. And hopefully the involvement of, say, Aboriginal, Torres Strait yes. Islander elders or people of that culture no, yeah. are yeah. required as well, yeah. Was there anything you wanted to add to that? Not particularly. I mean, I, I think that it's it's one of those things where I, I was just going to add earlier when you were talking about the mental health aspect mm -hmm. that um, even if decriminalised, there might be certain offences where it's picked up in terms of the way the mental health system deals with, mm, yes. for example, individuals who are causing risk to the community yeah. in the sense that it's not necessarily the case that just because you decriminalise it, that someone who is mentally very unwell and potentially going around causing really serious injury to people are... Um, left to their own device. Oh, no, they need a response. The question yeah. is whether it comes from the criminal justice system or social services. That's what I'm saying. I'm, uh, sorry, I'm not denying that someone who's committed a serious crime might need something to happen with them. It just should not be in the criminal justice system if they aren't criminally responsible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I can uh -huh. yeah. yeah, I can see some nods around, and I'm, I'm sure people have got some questions to ask. Um, but another sort of tricky one, too, is should reform come before raising the age? No. Uh-huh. It's great to get that clarity. <laughs> um, um, but... <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> no, because I just think... It, I just have seen in Australia the stalling process of... Yeah. You know, the... the uh, I can't remember what it's called now. The, uh, the COAG, the Coalition of Attorney Generals, who, who uh, I think it was... It's quite a few years ago now. Met to do, so have a. They wanted national action on this, and then they came back and said, "Oh, well, we've promised within a year we'll have a report recommending an increase in the age of criminal responsibility." They came back and said, "Oh no, we need to investigate alternatives first. What will we do if we raise the age of criminal responsibility?" And so, this is the wrong way round. If children aren't able to understand that what they've done is wrong. They shouldn't be in that system. Work that out afterwards. It'll give you an impetus to work it out. Mm. But the fact that we just keep stalling and all these children have been brought into the system, their lives have been ruined because governments are saying we need more time to work out what to do. And mm. soon work out what to do if those children couldn't be dealt with in the criminal justice That's system. That's right. Meanwhile, it seems like things have worsened yes. in that time, actually. And I think we have yeah. a lot of... I, I think that um, we just have so many good programs that are happening in Australia that the evidence base is kind of there now. We don't need to try to identify alternatives. The alternatives yes. are just set up. They just need to be supported properly. Yeah. yeah. I think a number of things obviously hold that back. And I know in my experience, the type of evidence is, is heavily critiqued by governments too. Um, that we haven't had randomised control trials or we haven't got gold standard research or the research is ageing or it's only among this population and it, the uh, feasibility study for transferability wasn't done to that population or governments change and the, um, the churn of the uh, workforce in governments, um, you know, largely a non-Indigenous workforce too, working on issues about First Peoples yeah. um, without that experience of 
and uh, working definition of cultural safety, for example. Yeah, so there's a number of factors there, even within reform, yeah. let alone. And so you're, you separate those two things quite clearly as yeah. well, which I think is you know, very wise and a take home as yeah. well, that raising the age arguably isn't a reform of the criminal justice system yeah. or youth justice system. It's and I think partly for me it comes from feeling for too long Argue, arguing, you know, yeah. what's practically feasible, and we're not getting anywhere doing that. No. I, I think that's part of the problem. For too long, it's just been let's let's try and wait and hope, and and it's not happening. <laughs> no, that's right. And meanwhile, we do say that the solutions lie in the community. They lie in the Aboriginal community, in Torres Strait Islander community, and Absolutely. you know, one of the projects I've worked on was um, hashtag Just Justice, and we published. 90 articles by 70 authors and about half Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, about many of the solutions that communities have mm -hmm. to, and um, you know, a lot more partnerships required between universities and communities, for example, to, to get um, that better evidence of community programs and leadership by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people into curriculum at universities, for example, so that next generation of service providers um, is prevented from having to do these retrospective um, sort of fits that we are now. Yeah, so, and so I wanted to, sort of you're at a community-based, um, you're know, very community-based in your work. Yeah, and um, you know, any reflections you've got on what you've seen work the, the, the best for whole families or individuals? I think that's a, that's a complicated question. Um, I do think that um, having families at the centre of a social response is a really necessary part and understanding that we're talking about often um, other trauma. You know, we're talking about social problems that need social solutions um, and obviously criminalising certain cohorts is not necessarily the best first step. Mm. I, I don't... Um, to to the earlier question, I don't necessarily think the process should be stalled while we come up with other social solutions to the problem, but I do accept that in a liberal democracy, being able to garnish, garner some broad support does mean being able to answer some of the difficult questions about how you will address the underlying social problems. And that's one of the reasons why I think the Northern Territory Government, when they announced the Step to 12, in announcing the On the Right Track program, so that you are announcing what the way that you see that you will deal with the social response at the same time as announcing the reform is a really important part of getting community buy-in to the perceived um, risk that, you know, it's going to, to, to in some way lead to a worsening of the, of the mm. issue. Mm. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Well, at this point, I might do a check-in with Carolyn just to <laughs> see whether she has some questions and any reflections for now as well. <laughs> Yeah, I'm thinking that as well. You know the the breadth and depth um, that these people are able to speak at, and we expect and we know that there's a lot of experience among you in the room. Uh, it's always great when you're asking a question that it is a question, as opposed to a statement. <laughs> I've never done that myself, obviously. <laughs> uh, so we'll take questions, and um, but. All that to say, um, dialogue is very valued as well and hearing a little bit from um, people and their experience too. So there's a mic, Ash has got the mic. Did we have a first nominee for a question asker? <laughs> well Thank done. Thank you so much. That was really, really interesting conversation. i got a question for all of you or any of you. I'd like to hear your points in regards to, if we think back a few it wasn't no long ago, or it was long ago, depends how you want to look at it, that uh, the minimum age was not 10 across all of the states. And that was an issue that was also much criticised by the UN for many reasons. So where we are now, like Thomas said, thanks goodness, after all this time, something's happening. Mm. But what is happening as well in regards to not having taken a federal approach where there is a unified decision and 
what are we going to see then mm. uh, across the three states? Mm. So yeah. any comments on that? Maybe? Yeah, I I have thought about that quite a lot because it was it was 2000 with the last two, the ACT and I um, can't remember the other place, that raised the age to 10. Uh, it was 2000, the last two states did that. And before that, there was a period where, you know, the, the, I think there were seven in both those states. Oh. Yeah. Um, and we're going to see that, we're going to see differences arising now. So a child could be criminally responsible in one state for committing an offence that they couldn't be criminally responsible for in a different state. I think it's better that we have that than that we just wait around at 10 until all states are, are going to agree on an age level. So I think it's unfortunate but I think it's a better situation than just waiting for agreement. Mm -hmm. And can I ask, would you like to add anything to that as well? I, I, I think, I, I agree I agree with, with, with that answer, that I, I think it's definitely better that the states that feel willing to move forward do, do so, and the states that don't um, have the benefit of the experience of those, those states that do, in terms of being able to see how the social response works being able to tailor their law in response to that as well. Um, it's, there, are, there are any number of social reforms where states have done it at different rates, um, decriminalising homosexuality being one of them, where some states you know, abolished it very, very late in the piece, but we're now there where it's decriminalised in every state. Um, so you know, I think it is the case, it's naturally the case when you're talking about a federalised system that if you don't get national agreement that some states are going to go first. Mm. Add to that or? No, I, I think I just agree. I think it'll be, <laughs> I think it'll be a bit tricky if we wait. Yeah. So I think it's just one of the things we have to deal with in how Australia is set up. So, yeah. but it is a really good, a really good point. Yeah, well. and great point about other social issues. Mm. Yeah, and um, yeah, and healthcare in prisons or health. I wouldn't call it care. Health services, mm -hmm. health punitivity in, in prisons, health lack of access mm. in prisons. Um, you know, suffers greatly from that same, the same variance and that arguably lack of federal coordination there um, plays out with great difficulty, you know, and we, we know that healthcare plays into, um, this is a determinant, a shared determinant of crime and criminal justice system engagement and holding people back from healing and moving on um, with their lives too, so. Yeah, it's an issue, like as Crystal said, that yeah, it's part of that federation. So, where are we going to go next? <laughs> um, next theme. Ooh, hand up down the back, thank you. <laughs> Someone's been volunteered to ask a question. <laughs> we saw that. Thank you so much for thank you. your insights on this very complex issue. Um, I think I've taught in high schools for 26 years. I uh, spent day in, many days with 10 to 14 year olds. I just have to disagree with the argument that 10 to 14 year olds do not know what is criminally responsible. Um, I think it's uh, quite naive to make a blanket statement that all 10 to 14 year olds do not know what is criminally responsible. Uh, having spent uh, time with them uh, in a education context um, over 26 years, um, also, I think incarceration is a separate issue um, from whether the child is aware that they did what they did was criminally responsible. Uh, that's a sentencing outcome. And I, I didn't hear any research that shows that in Australia the incarceration rates for children has actually decreased um, over the years. Um, but look, to my question, um, the victims of crime, I think, is the issue. Uh, how can, and it's an issue for the whole legal system, how can we balance the uh, needs of the uh, justice needs for victims, offenders and society? The Bulger case was glossed over, but that was a two-year-old who was um, abducted and tortured over several hours, and then the two 10-year-olds actually crushed his skull. Um, so I guess my question is, well, my question is, how can we attend to the needs of the victims? Because I think if we raise the criminal age, um, it won't address the causes and won't have that, that sense of responsibility, which is missing now, is actually going to be worse. And I think if we don't get that sense of responsibility first, uh, we're not going to address all these causes that we're talking about. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, so good to hear. So your experience as a teacher in those classrooms for a long time and, um, yeah, bringing 
to mind victims of crime too. I think we're in agreement that victims of crime play a big role here and also the need for reforms. So we do benefit from someone with that experience. Yeah, from your I mean, it's glossed over only because of lack of time first, mm. of course. Uh, the second point, I agree, detention is a completely separate issue to the issue of criminal responsibility. And this is no disrespect to your experience, but there was a lot of research about how children process information, which suggests that they do not understand in the same way that an adult understands uh, that what they're doing is right or wrong. And I'm not saying that you're doing this, but governments tend to make it a very simple question, is do they know, do they know it's right or do they know it's wrong? The whole question is a lot more complicated than that, and their way that they process information is a lot more complicated than that. It requires a lot deeper understanding of social structures. Um, so I would completely disagree with you on, on that point, and I, I can point you to a lot of research that shows uh, that what I'm saying mm. is, is, uh, can be verified. Um, and yeah, with, uh, you're right, with the, with the Jamie Bodge case, the problem was you know, that was a horrific crime, of course, and, and the public saw lots of images of that, so it was very visceral. About the same time, though, there was a similar crime occurred, I can't remember if it was Norway, uh, or it was a, a Scandinavian country where a, a young child had killed another child in quite similar, I don't know if it's quite similar circumstances, but it was, it was a young child who killed another child, and they did not have that public outcry. They did not have a criminal justice response. That child was dealt with within the social services department. And so that, you know, it don't, we don't have to respond to childhood offending the way that we do in Australia or in England or New Zealand or, or basically all common law countries. Mm. Thank you. I'm Did just, I'm just going to go... Of these children as they've grown up in adulthood? In children who've been taken into the criminal justice system? Children that have been dealt with in the criminal justice system, yes, there is a real problem with recidivism. I'm not sure about that. There's probably a range of data, but I was actually going to ask um, you, you know, in your experience of uh, the social services response or health and wellbeing response compared to criminal justice system response. And Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things too, I mean, for me, most of my experience has been practising regionally in New South Wales. One of the challenges we also have is postcode justice. So what you have available to you here in Sydney in terms of what you can put in place to support is unfortunately not the same everywhere. And that's part of the challenge, whether it's a social problem or in terms of how you deal with the, the psychological, the social, the cultural, the health, the educational response, is that it's hard to provide that in a uniform way. Um, it's one of the nuances that needs to be tackled in relation to this topic is how you provide a, a sufficient social response mm. everywhere. And we're, we're a bit different to the UK in that respect, and we've found this throughout different versions of the criminal justice system, including, for example, how special cautioning works. In the UK, geographically such a tiny country, really? it's actually much more straightforward to provide social services. I'm not necessarily saying they, they do it, you know, very well, but obviously we are very geographically dispersed. It means that you know, your, your drive to the nearest hospital could be, you know, several, a couple of hours away um, in, in parts of New South Wales. And so that is one of the real challenges once you get down to the nitty gritty. The other thing I just wanted to say to the gentleman's question is that um, it's obviously, it's a very complex topic with a lot of nuance in it. And one of the things that I find hard is sometimes you can pick the worst example and it's really, really difficult to get the nuance in because, as you can imagine, most 11-year-olds that we represent in the children's court are not people who have crushed each other's skulls in. But the risk that the same social response is seen to be required is obviously part of the nuance in this. How do we build a system that responds appropriately to 11-year-olds, appropriately to 13-year-olds? The way Dolly Incapax works is that it effectively does assess whether or not that particular child does have the capacity to, you know, to find whether something is seriously wrong or not. And the way the current law works in New South Wales through the High Court decision of RP and the Queen is the closer to 14 you are, the more presumption there is that you are capable of understanding in terms of, you know, how the shifting works. But obviously it's not an easy topic. It's a complicated topic. Mm -hmm. it's even our understanding of the word understand mm -hmm. too and to assess for that yeah. in, in a way that sentencing 
options are presented. Yeah. It's highly complex. That's right, and I, and I also agree with the gentleman that there's a distinction between custody and other responses, and there, there has to be, yeah. and that is a challenging thing. But the, the ordinary social response, I think we all kind of learn in school, you know, bad people go to jail, and that's the res social response for people who, who do the wrong thing. But the sophisticated understanding we have of the impacts of jail on people uh, that we need to think about how, how we design a system that best... Um, discourages the commission of criminal offending and supports people who have a lot of underlying trauma. Mm. Addressing those underlying determinants, mm. you know, poverty, um, connection to community, uh, self-concept, yeah, so much in the prevention. You know, we, we actually, you know, don't see the same amount of money going to prevention that we do to the criminal justice system, for example. You know. Yeah, I think there's some nods around there. All right, well, we shall travel over your way and see what, uh, what theme and challenge is. Uh, possibly several. Um, hi, I'm Demir. I'm the policy lead at Change the Record, and Sophie was a very good friend of mine, so thank you. I might add she was a student here as well. I didn't, I didn't say that. Um, so I've got... Um, uh, I'm, I'm wondering... The... the the question of child children's rights comes up for me a lot in this conversation and it, it's interesting the provocation from our colleague down the back and it came up on the panel as well there was this binary drawn between children who are criminalized and victims when we know that the vast majority of children in that system have themselves been victimized interpersonally and systemic systemically um, and one of the things that was interesting about the bill that the ACT brought to raise the age was that there were all of these ways of kind of, there were all of these things in the bill that were basically um, rebranding business as usual in the process of criminalising children. So there was a new form of youth detention invented that miraculous, that somehow wasn't covered by OPCAT, for example. Um, and when it was pointed out that, you know, there was no human rights oversight of the new invented category of detention, the government went, oh, crap, yeah, you're right. We might go back and come back with some amendments about that. Oops, terribly sorry. Um, and there's other stuff in the bill that is kind of dodgy as well, not just the staggered approach and the carve-outs. Um, I'm, I'm wondering the panel's thoughts on the, the salience of human rights discourse in, in doing this and how, how useful that discourse would be to solve the political problem of the kind of intractability and recalcitrance of governments. Because I agree with you, Thomas, a lot of this is politics. Um, and I, in my work, I try very hard to figure out how to cut through the politics and do something mm. effective. Mm. I'm wondering what you guys think about the value of human rights discourse when clearly it can be thrown away by a government as they did in Queensland, but it can also discipline a government in, like in the ACT. Mm. Okay, who would like to I go? I think that's a question for the academics. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have a slight issue with going down the children's rights route because what I have seen is it turned around to be it's respecting children's rights to hold, to hold them criminally responsible. So they have to be dealt with in this way because that's how we treat them as adults in... in you know, the, uh, 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 I can't think of the word. I mean, you know... The, future adults. I can't remember the word. I've had a colleague who writes about this who's um, saying that we have to do this. Not to responsibilise children is to deny them their rights to future adulthood. So I, I, I have a little bit of a problem going down that track. And it also reminds me of that sort of uh, the, the British approach back in the sort of uh, 80s of we need to go back to a harsher justice model for dealing with children because this respects their rights better than using welfare measures like Scotland's doing. So I, 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 I see what you're saying, but I think it can actually be detrimental to what we're trying to achieve rather than promote what we're trying to achieve, mm. at least in, in that form that I've seen it be used. Yeah. Would you like to add anything? Uh, yeah, I think it's important to have it as the package. Like, I feel like you have to bring in human rights, although, as we've seen in Queensland, they can just suspend, <laughs> suspend human rights. <laughs> so I think it, that's why it's kind of important to have it as something that we talk about because it's, it's important to the, what we're talking about, but kind of sit it with all the other um, 
issues that we're that we're kind of dealing with. But yeah, it's certainly important in in raising the next generation of service providers because they're crystal clear statements that guide practice when when someone's training in social work, for example, or family care, or or health and human services to. And our United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is something that we put for first and foremost with very clear statements um, to shape thinking, if not action, too. Yeah. A few thoughts there on human rights. Yeah, another tricky one. Okay, we're, we're ready now. We're just warming up. <laughs> Ignore the champagne popping over there. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you. Um, how would you deal with uh, people that have, like in their Northern Territory, how it's been zoned for now 12 and up to be criminally responsible? How would you deal with those already incarcerated who are 10 and 11 years old? Yeah, would you like to? There, there is usually a bit of a lag <laughs> in, in bringing out policy. Yeah, we can kind of see this, again, I, just because I sit in Queensland, I can kind of see that, uh, give it as an example. So Queensland was the last state to bring up the um, age of majority. So we were, we're putting 17-year-olds into um, adult prisons until about maybe four, three or four years ago. And after talking to a lot of the caseworkers that are sitting in, up in youth detention centres, they said that, that they're only now seeing the effects of that. So there is usually a bit of a lag um, between that in how we bring in policy. Um, but yeah, it would be important to kind of um, be able to retrospectively think about how to apply policy in that area as well. Mm. I think too, to draw on other levers, um, you know, we know that there's very high rates of um, uh, poor, uh, mental health, poor mental health, mental health um, diagnoses, trauma, and post-traumatic stress disorder, and poor so uh, social um, determinants of health as well. And coming from a public health perspective, um, most people in youth detention could be cared for in the community for the other things that they've got going on for them too. And what we know from other nations are can be cared for effectively in the community too. So, but we have that reality of the lag too. I think it's, you know, really timely to talk about abolition and the importance of us having abolition on our spectrum of, of what we're, able to allow our minds to think about and to update our own software in our own minds and our own interpretations of what abolition might mean. You know, it's often taboo for people to say, I'm an abolitionist or I'm, you know, but people's minds want to go there as much as people's minds want to shut it down as well. I think, you know, in, in respect for the suffering the clear suffering of people in the criminal justice system and in prisons and young people and children in prisons, you know, out of respect for them, they deserve us to push our thinking about decarceration options, you know, as urgent and as safe and as contributing to community safety by preventing later adult incarceration, for example, that has other costs and for us to think about value in different ways too and cost in different ways. There might be the cost to the public purse, but there's a cost to the individual, to the family across generations. There's a cost to our country when knowledge holders are incarcerated and damage occurs to country and multiple losses for our cultures that have had such histories in this country. So we've got to really be pushing our thinking and. Yeah, big ups to you for coming, asking that question. Well, I think your hand got pushed up there. But was there anything you would like to ask as well, um, yourself? Oh, so, well, so the two years of criminal past, well, yeah, is 12 to 14, what's the difference in the age of um, No, but I mean, in terms of practical terms in the Northern Territory, um, you do end up with this gap of kids that have been incarcerated
generally? I mean, I was going to ask you, do you work on things like compassionate release from prison for children? I mean, I think, I think in, in that context, I, I don't know what they've done in the NT in terms of whether they'll introduce some transitional provisions for how it's dealt with. Most very young children serve relatively short sentences. Um, that's not exclusively the case, but what you might find is that it's introduced in a way that means that their sentences lapse rather than necessarily that they're released. They still have a sentence that's been handed down. But I think it's a really, really good question, and it's something that each jurisdiction that brings it in will need to think about, is how do you actually transition? Um, and it's not the kind of thing that can necessarily be an overnight thing where, you know, suddenly tomorrow, um, if you're 12, you get prosecuted differently. The other thing too is if you look at the way the Northern Territory is introducing this on the right track program, it's still the police who become involved initially, but it's about police referring when they, when they realise that an offending person is really young, it's about referring that person into the social supports that, that are being put in place instead of um, undertaking the criminal process with them. So mm -hmm. that would be the kind of thing that, that would operate in relation to systems mm -hmm. like this. And then it's probably important to name prevention, preventing reincarceration. You know, I know in adult mm. um, settings, at least 80% have been incarcerated multiple times. So mm. the follow-up care the support um, in that transition to the community, the support for families post-release as well, are really important parts of the picture that um, you know, we've got to continue to advocate for. Uh, yeah. Was that a hand over this way? No. Okay, another question? Thank you. The, the Young Offenders Act of New South Wales uh, did transform the way that children and young people are dealt with um, in this state. Um, I went to a celebration here, 25 years of the Young Offenders Act. It took, took 25 years for it to become normal, right? It did contribute to the reduction in offending. It did contribute to uh, reduction in young people in custody. Um, and, and, and it did so for Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. So just a bit of a... Thank you. You know, a... A good news story, you know, and a, and, a, and a thumbs up to the Young Offenders Act uh, and those, the people that drafted or worked on that, introducing that, <laughs> were here, you know, most of them were still alive and uh, retired professors or whatever. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and police um, uh, in New South Wales um, only charge, they charge less than 30% of young people, right? The Young Offenders Act is applied as it was intended. Um, for most young people, um, a caution is adequate. There's been systematic reviews of police cautions being absolutely ad adequate, even without a service response, um, uh, in dealing with just diverting young people from the system. And police are doing that. Well, conferencing is a great scheme, but it's only 3% of the Young Offenders Act. Warnings, cautions, fines, in unofficial diversion, is, is, that's working, right? Um, uh, so we have had this sort of transformation. Uh, but Megan, you talked about we need an individual, family, systems and systemic uh, response simultaneously. Uh, a, a big ask, right? And the closest thing I could think about to that was say the Young Offenders Act was, was as close to that as I can recall. Can any of you recall any other such transformation in this state or in Australia um, that did that simultaneously uh, uh, synthesise an individual, family, community and systems response? Because I, I cannot think of... Uh, that's like the holy grail, Meg. So, <laughs> I'll, I'll, that's easy. I'll, I'll name two. <laughs> Very good. The, the Wallama list of the Sydney District Court, which has been introduced recently, which is... Um, Wallama is a Darug word meaning come back, which is about coming back to a community, uh, like a crime-free life. And that's a culturally-based program that's designed to take I Indigenous people who are in the criminal justice system and provide wraparound services um, in the kind of way that, when you look at this proposal, I think that that's perhaps the closest thing that, that, that you're saying. And the second thing that I would say is the drug courts of New South Wales. There's recently been an expansion to the drug court in Dubbo. The Sydney drug court's expanding this year with the second trance of expansion coming next year. And of course, the drug court program is revolutionary in the sense that it takes a person who would otherwise potentially be serving a full-time sentence of imprisonment 
and provides them um, such regular contact and interaction with the court that they're provided a wraparound service for drug supports, sometimes rehabilitation, sometimes just your analysis and other community supports, but nevertheless, a way to take something that would otherwise be squarely criminal justice and deliver a social response, if I can put it that way. I, I agree with you, the Young Offenders Act as a whole is a, um, I think it's been a really, really important piece of legislation in New South Wales. And I guess if the age was raised, it would still be um, for a cohort of young people. Um, what we're talking about is the youngest of those people and whether or not the very youngest one should still be subject to the system. Excellent. My example would be community, Aboriginal community controlled organisations too are often planned and organised to work at each of those levels simultaneously. And we know that they're underinvested in compared to need and that demand outstrips um, what they can supply. And we also know there's evidence for their effectiveness and their quality. And also high numbers of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff, often around 50% of staff at those organisations, whereas mainstream governments tend to um, not be able to achieve their 2.5 2 or 3% target with high levels of um, staff turnover, unlike Aboriginal community controlled organisations. So we've got, you know, really important examples there to consider investing in, learn more about, learn how to partner, learn how to be a good partner of those organisations and bolster their, um, their rights to exist and their needs and aspirations in the future as well. And there's a lot of, um, you know, nods there, but I think we're also being given the nod up here. <laughs> Um, but uh, from us, on behalf of us as a panel, to thank people for their questions and um, con continue the discussion um, during the rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was such a provocative um, discussion. And I think especially coming to that question of abolition and, and decarceration, I think that's a really interesting way to sort of be um, provoking us further to think about our responses and what sort of community do we want to have in, in, in terms of our responses to children, to young people when they um, are potentially doing behaviour that we uh, treat as transgressive at the very least. I think that just a number of the issues that have come up for me that I was sort of making notes about are just the complexities, the fact that we do know that most of the children aren't committing these horrendous crimes. There's you know, a lot of other much minor, um, you know, joyriding, property crimes, those sorts of things. Uh, are these places, such as Dondale, are they the places where these children should be placed? Are they going to be coming out of these places as better people or will they be succumbing to the so-called university of crime and coming out as, as um, perhaps more brutalised than they were beforehand. Um, the notion that a lot of these young people have also been victims themselves, I think, is, is really important to consider. The ripple effects of taking children away from their families, from their communities, um, has to be something that has to be considered. Looking at other um, forms of responses in the health system rather than the criminal justice system, looking at diversionary um, programs I think is really incredibly important. Looking at education, looking at family, looking at community, all of these um, issues that have been brought up uh, by our panellists I think are very important for us to consider as we look at how we criminalise very young children. Um, I don't know that we've necessarily come up with any hard answers, but I do think that there's been some really great provocations that have been given to all of us to consider uh, in terms of the type of society that we want to have and how we want to treat children and young people. Um, so anyway, I would now like to uh, invite you to thank, uh, thank our panel of Thomas Crofts, Crystal Lockwood, Megan Williams and Robert Hoyles for their insights. I'd also now like to um, invite you all to come and have some canapes and some uh, drinks that you could hear popping earlier. So uh, please come and join us and we're happy to talk about some of these issues in more detail with you as well. Thank you so much for coming out on such a hot night. <laughs>
It's so good. Oh, it's amazing. It's amazing. No, it's not the right thing. Specifically, look at this, but I'm looking at vulnerable defendants. So yeah. this comes up. Yeah, yeah. 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 someone did say to you that there's a sign or something like that. <laughs> oh, <it's so> <laughs> we see a lot of people. No, really great to you. Oh, thank you. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, no, yeah, yeah, it was. It was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Wish we could have had some yeah. 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 Thanks so much. That was great. Yeah. 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 No worries. Thank <laughs> you.